um, and what is kernel patch verify. So if you go GitHub, you should probably see this um, repository online. So this kind of started off uh, almost a decade or so back, I think, more than a decade back now, uh, when we were starting to do patches for Android. Uh, and we realized that many of the contributors didn't have the Linux background. Uh, but we wanted to maintain some sort of uh, tech uh, in place. So I had started off with what, what I used to call back in the day uh, as KMake, as initial shell script, uh, which was doing some basic, you know, git bisect kind of checks, checks in place. Uh, since then, I noticed that Thero, Thero, Christo, and Dan Murphy, who used to be in our teams, they kind of uh, did their own thing in parallel. And we took an opportunity of comparing all three of them and uh, rewriting everything from scratch. Um, at least back then, I used to have a hatred for Python. Um, so it ended up as a bash script, So which is what we have today. Uh, yeah, so if you do like a help command, you see a lot of uh, static command build options, which allows you to do static checks. Uh, if you folks are familiar with the basic build flags, uh, for example, there is w equal to n, uh, which allows you to add warning. Uh, by default, Linux build doesn't generate a lot of warning. In fact, it, unless it is catastrophic, it doesn't generate a warning. But then you can do w equal to two, for example, in which uh, more frequent warnings come in, and there are different levels that you can generate out. Uh, and of course, you can combine the various warnings over here. For the more um, more interested folks, people usually run with the C equal to two check, which introduces another tool called sparse. Uh, there is yet another checker, uh, which is called Ocinelli. There's something called S match, and quite a few tools. Okay, so remind back back in the day uh, we had sparse back then. Uh, Ocinelli did not exist then. Um, S match and many of the new tools that you see today did not exist back then. But the theme remained. Uh, two major themes that there are standard set of checks that you have to do when you're posting patches. That's one theme. And the second theme is that over time, new checks gets added into Linux kernel and new rules appear. Uh, sometimes the old rules go away too. Now, we needed some way to incorporate all of this so that, you know, we are all human. We all make, uh, you know, forgetful mistakes from time to time, uh, which we don't desire to, but sometimes it happens. So, this is what essentially that entire script does. You go to kernel patch verify, zoom in. This is a core script. Uh, what it does is to run a bunch of checkers. Okay? And there are different types of checks it does. Uh, it looks at patches as a series of changes. So it looks at a change before the entire series starts. Uh, looks, looks at the system at the end of the full series. It also does a bisectability check as well. Every single patch it checks as a sequence to make sure things are fine. Uh, it tries to do some level of intelligence in the middle uh, because some of the warnings are a little painful to work with, blah, blah, blah. So it tries to simplify a little bit here and there, but it's still a shell script. So, you know, there are still mistakes that it cannot handle very well. Uh, one of the biggest caveats that we have with this script is an issue that has not been closed so far is Git submodule repositories. It can handle Git work tree relatively well, uh, but Git submodules is probably something that's finding it hard to, to uh, figure out which directory it is on. Again, uh, it is not a kernel patch verify script issue, but um, we went one level further. Yes, kernel patch verify by itself is great, but it also depends on a lot of tools in the back end. Uh, the latest, for example, is the DT schema, for example. 
Uh, DT schema keeps on changing every year. Uh, I mean, every month it used to. Right now it is kind of settled down in 2023-01. It's not been updated in Feb. I'm hoping to see an update in March. I don't know if it's going to happen. Uh, but different tools have different updates and people have been using different baselines. Some people don't update their DT schema. Some people do. To prevent all of this, uh, I switched over to using containers as default. Uh, so, uh, so running on the back end so that I get uh, on my WSL system. Uh, anyway, so uh, the Docker file by itself is rather trivial. Uh, it installs all basic packages that you need for building Linux kernel. So typically when people ask, what do I need for building Linux kernel, I usually refer to this list. Uh, it also installs, uh, it uses a secondary script, uh, which is here, buildenv.sh, which, by the way, installs a custom Git version, custom DTC, custom sparse, smash, something called a Scorchinelli, uh, and, of course, the DT scheme. Now, each of these tools is used by the kernel patch verify script itself, but installing these tools itself is... A little bit of a dependency, right? Uh, you need JSON schema and YAML lint, for example, before you install DT schema, for example. Sparse has its own set of dependencies too. All of this, uh, instead of each of us discovering it one by one, uh, it does it internally. There is a GitHub workflow as well that I've installed here. Uh, so if you look at the GitHub workflow, it builds and it deploys to Docker repository itself. So you've, you find that here uh, as one of the packages that, it, I mean, it's a package that it deploys into uh, GitHub, uh, GitHub re uh, registry for Docker. So you can do something like this. Yeah, and if you do a Git pull of this, it practically works. Yeah. No problem. Popular management. So, it, it, of course, my mission is updated with the latest, uh, but to get this, get the very latest is just a git pull, and it has LLVM pre-installed. Uh, that way you have an out-of-box uh, build and verification environment. Uh, the wrapper for the script is called something called as KPV. What KPV does is to do a bunch of local stuff, including pulling the very latest version of the container. Uh, and it does some mounting stuff locally as well. Uh, that way your user ID matches with the version that is uh, in the container, etc. So think of KPV as a wrapper around a container that has all the required packages in addition to having kernel patch verify installed. Okay? That's what KPV is all about. Uh, the second helper script is called KPS. KPS is a trivial script that instead of running kernel patch verify by default, it drops you into a bash shell. That's the only difference. Uh, it gives you the exact same environment as a KPV is, same container, you're just in a shell. So you can manually run certain checks. For example, you don't have a um, compiler installed on your PC, for example. You could use the container to build in a kernel and to run the checks just like how kernel patch verify would be. Typically, this is useful when kernel patch verify reports a problem, you're not able to reproduce it, then you want to dig down into the details. So I'm going to use KPV because that standardizes the environment um, no matter which system I'm working on. So if I run KPV minus H, it is essentially running kernel patch verify minus H help command. Uh, it gives you the help options. Kernel Patch Verify itself uh, is meant to work with multiple architectures, but every architecture is kind of a little unique kind of deal. Um, so uh, I've kind of given some short forms, like minus V, for example, says that it is a, a V8 platform. Um, unfortunately, ARM V8 came as an afterthought. <laughs> um, so I ended up using ARM v7 as the default and v8 as an override on top of it. 
uh, not good, but that's what I ended up doing. Um, due to backward compatibility, I couldn't you know, change the you know, switch flags at all. Uh, minus C, capital C, is the other uh, option that is, uh, that is interesting. Minus C is what you should actually be using when you're sending patches upstream. Minus C does a lot of additional checks. Um, and if you look at the script and you wanted to see what those checks are, you will see, um, I'll show you an example. For example, uh, if you look at this variable called as complete test, right? Um, it'll, it'll do additional checks like checking for stack, checking for namespace, checking to ensure that you have got the right includes, header checks are proper, all that crap gets additionally tested. Uh, it also goes, uh, yeah, um, I'm starting to forget how many tests have been involved. Uh, it will also test SMAX and Cochinelli. By default, Cochinelli is not tested. At least back in the day, the PCs were relatively slow and Cochinelli check does take a bit of time. Uh, so it, it wasn't doing that. Now, maybe this doesn't need to be an optional test. Uh, S-match is nice to check as well, but it does give a bunch of false positives too. Now that's something to be careful about. Like every other tool, um, this tool has limitations too. Some of the checks can be false positives uh, and you need to look very closely at your code to figure out what has gone wrong. All right, so how do you run this thing? So in my case, with log minus minus one line, so I have a patch from a series of patches, in fact, which I've been picking up for verification since uh, uh, 2030, 03, 10, which is probably last week. -ish. Yeah, last week, last Friday. Uh, but anyway, uh, the patches, there are N patches, okay, on my branch called Beagle Play. Uh, and I'm going to check maybe one patch or maybe five patches whatever, right? The way to quickly run this guy is run kpv minus c minus v because I'm checking for arm v8. In this case, I'm trying to check my original version of the patch that I had done uh, for uh, pinbox, uh, you know, the head of movement change. Um, minus n1, okay? Now, if I have not done a build at all, is going to fail and it's going to come back and tell me that uh, I need to have at least a dot config in place. Right? So, okay, what did I do here? Minus C, minus V, minus N. Missing apps. Okay, so in this case, it is saying that I do not have, yeah, I don't have GCC installed. Don't have it. So minus L will use LLVM as the compiled flow. Now, what is he complaining? He complains that I don't, I, I don't have a dot config. Okay. It kind of insists to have a dot config. You, you can override that by using minus C option and can say minus C use the default def config. This is one way of doing it. Uh, or the other option is uh, 64 make this is so I have a um, you know alias to build my stuff so I did a def config and then I have a script called only ti dot uh, sh what it does is rather trivial it replaces all configurations uh, with equal to no uh within the dot config file if it is not k3 that's all it does okay and this only works for arm 64. it's not that smart a script but something i cooked up in a few minutes uh why is this interesting because if you don't do this when you're building for dtbs it'll check for every single architecture device tree blobs and that can take significantly long time you don't want to build that way you just want to build the K3 DTPs at this stage. Uh, so I've kind of trimmed with my script, I've trimmed the dot config, the default def config uh, to just TI def configs and I run old config. 
yet again. Now this makes sense as long as you're building just for K3 based components. But if you're, if you're touching something core, uh, like the device core layers or the architecture core layers, you should not be disabling like how I just did, because you want to make sure that every architecture uh, is fine and not just the K3 architecture. Level. So be careful when you use this. Most of the times, at least from the areas that we work in, this should be okay. Now, and the last step it does is the old old config so that it updates the dot config appropriately. Now that I have it, minus L should run kernel patch verify. Now, let's run a stop on site. Now you can, this is probably a bad window, let's see. Better. Now you can see what it is doing in the back end. It is using its building right now, but since I built already, it's hitting C cache most of the time. Um, and it is running Clang to do the basic build, etc. So with minus C, uh, it does a complete build of the kernel, and that takes a bit of time, uh, followed by building uh, the DTP. In this case, in my case, I have a Pretty decent machine for build. Um, you know, the usual NVMe drive and all the crap. So the build actually just got done in 30 seconds. Um, and then now it is, it will rewind the patch back. Okay. Now the way this guy works is he creates a temporary branch called as kernel patch verified dot dollar dollar sign, temporary branch of that sort. It rewinds the number of patches you told him to rewind back and does a baseline build, okay? Now, from that build onwards, he's now going to do checks. And his intent is to ensure that you do, you have not introduced any new failures. Uh, you can't have a build regression of any sort. You cannot introduce a warning of any sort. If it detects any of those warnings, it's going to report back to you. Uh, so it takes a baseline. Now it is applying the first patch. It ran through some basic checks here. So it will git am your patch, just like how the maintainers would do a git am of a patch. It would also do a um, check patch dot uh, pl dot script slash check patch dot pl on your patch and ensure that there are no check patch warnings. And then it will do a basic build test. It will run sparse in this case. Uh, since I'm modifying a header file, it runs sparse. It runs cochinelli and it runs smatch. Now, if it was a device tree uh, related patch, for example, it would run deep test. In this case, it has to do that as well. Uh, it would run, it would build your device tree blob. It will convert your device tree blob to device tree source uh, with DTC compiler and see if DTC compiler itself is reporting any warnings of any form. And then it would run your DTBs check, which is the standard checker that we all run. There is a caveat. As you can notice here, one of my CPUs is 100% loaded and none of the other CPUs are loaded. That's because the DT validate uh, from DT schema, which is the base script that is used for running DT, you know, device tree checks, that's single threaded. So it doesn't, you know, uh, move that load around. So this is usually the longest step when you're doing device tree checks. And this is also why you want to uh, reduce the dot config down to K3 alone. That way, as you can see here, it'll run the checks on every single device tree. So, so it goes through ah. CPUs. There you go. Yeah, this can take a few minutes. End of it, uh, it finishes all these checks and then it will generate a test report, which is for all intents is a diff. You had some warnings before, you applied your patch, do you have warnings later? If there are no warnings between what you did before and what you did after, it gives you a green light. So this is all come, patch verify is all. It kind of helps you save a lot of pain in the community uh, because there are automated scripts like how um, 
the kernel.org zero day checker comes along uh, and that's a good pass to see. Uh, let's bring up, this is build version one. So, Nishai, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, why don't we integrate that into our uh, commit process so that it's, you know, what gets run before um, a developer commits a patch? Because it, it, this is so intensive. Right? So when you're, when you're, yes, you can put Git hooks and integrate this into your you know, Git commit flow. Uh, but it is extremely intensive from compute perspective, and it takes time, as you can see, uh, especially the DT validates that. Now, if you put all of this uh, as part of a commit flow, then well, people are going to be slow. Well, but is there um, a happy medium here where we could have, you know, maybe not the full blown, you know, we we can pick the lower uh, cost checks yes. so that, you, you know, it's it automated. Yeah, you could. In theory, without the minus C option, it will not do the, you know, DT checks, etc. But do the basic development commit, etc. But then you have the usual problem because even like a minute worth of check or a 30 second worth of check, right? Uh, you don't want that to come in the way of let's say a git rebase minus i, um, and git commit hooks will trigger at that point again. So you don't want that either. So it's kind of, um, there's no hard and fast rule itself uh, into enforcing this. Uh, different people have diff taken different styles. The, the folks at zero day essentially pull your patches down and they will check it for you and report back, which is good. In this case, it reported an issue for me. Uh, I recreated this environment as is by creating a container. Uh, and then when I ran the checks, I figured out that I was on the wrong baseline. And these guys were testing on a 6.3 RC1. And I had to rebase on, on top of that. So I had to put some dependency that was not very clear to them. So, yes and no. It can be, but it will probably slow the developers down. Uh, rather, if especially if you're doing the initial development, you want to get it right, make it working first, and then you want to do the cleanups next stage because cleanups can be quickly done uh, compared to doing it as part of your dev process. So he's running, right now he's running the last uh, post checks. Uh, apply the patches, he's run the checks again, uh, now he's doing the very last group of checks. So even for one little patch with a header file change, right? Um, it does take some time to run. Now, if you have like 20 patches, 30 patches in the series, it, that's a painful se sequence to go through. All right, while this guy is running, I can show you some patches, like this is one of those patches. Uh, it was my mistake, I thought I ran it, but as you noticed, I had run this series on top of other dependencies uh, when I posted the patches last Saturday. So obviously um, zero day checking refused and it warned me saying that your dependencies are not the tooler. So that caught. Uh, here is another little issue that my script did not catch. Uh, in this case, it's a chain order problem. So the from is from uh, Robert Nelson, but the sign off order is from Nishant followed by Robert Nelson. That's not permitted. It should have been Robert Nelson followed by Nishant. Now check patch will warn you saying that you cannot have sign off and code develop separated. So the correct order, and this is painful, Correct order is to put sign off on top, co developed, and then my sign off on the end. Uh, that is end up, essentially what I ended up doing in the, uh, the latest revision of patches. So there were two warnings, at least one warning which the script couldn't catch. The other warning I could have caught with my script if I had put it on the right baseline. There are a uh, lot of similar stuff that we can see in uh, TI if I was just the error 
uh, similar patches that we can see. The last, I think, was Vaishnav who got beat up uh, because he hadn't done, um, you know, bisectable patches. Uh, yeah, so there are a lot of similar pains that you can see on the list that you don't need to go through if you're running this script. So this is more about convention within the community. Right. This is think about static checkers, right? Uh, static checkers like um, like style. Uh, Cochinelli is a lot more uh, deep in comparison. Um, it goes into semantic analysis. Moon uh, steps Cochi slash. Let's take a free one. Uh, I know free. Okay, so look at this little guy here, right? Uh, if you see an expression that in the code, for example, if you see an expression that says, if E is not equal to null, then do K free or various versions of free and depends on this thing. Uh, why don't you just use K free uh, this, right? And you say that it is not needed because the free function by itself has an internal check. So why do you, why are you using if not null as a check for free? Uh, that goes a little more deeper than just style. Um, it has knowledge about how the free function is implemented. Uh, and it tries to say that if you are using this checker on top, uh, it really serves no purpose. So it kind of optimizes a little bit. Yes, and it can be used to catch real bugs too. I remember doing something. Like DevM free, right? If you're using DevM malloc, okay, a pointer with DevM malloc, it tracks that pointer. And if it sees that you're using free of that pointer, you're not supposed to do that because DevM function uh, is a garbage collector of its own. As long as the device is instantiated and not destroyed, uh, it will allocate that memory and attribute it to that device node. When the device node is destroyed as part of, let's say, a remove function, etc., the system will automatically free those pages for you. So if you were to use k-free function, that's actually a bug because you'll end up double freeing it. So some places this can be used to catch very, very deep bugs, but very common bugs. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, Smatch also tries to do something of that form. It has caught some very, very, uh, very interesting kind of optimization and bug uh, because of sequence of steps that we do. But of all the tools, I kind of like Cochinelli because it, it can do multiple things. Uh, simultaneously, and it is not very cosmetic kind of bugs. Uh, it's very deep, actually relevant bugs that you find. All right, so going back into kernel patch verify. So remember what I told you about uh, false positives, right? So it said that my patch failed because when it was checking for device tree bindings and it found this little guy. Now it will report any form of delta plus or minus as a failure. That's something to be careful about. Uh, I haven't figured out how to make it smarter. Uh, so even if you were to do a bug fix, kernel patch verify will tell you it is a fail because you cleaned up a warning and that will appear as a negative delta that you cleaned up a warning and it will flag it as a failure. Uh, so which is why you should read the report before saying that your patch is broken. Uh, in this case, the only thing that is reporting is this. MR proper shouldn't be reporting a change. Uh, this is a false positive yet again. Uh, otherwise, it's clean in this case. But you can create bugs, uh, and the various checkers in this list will probably cache them for you. But as we know, Linux kernel is not about just static checks alone. There is review that goes in. Uh, as part of the review, as I've shown, one of the examples of my own patch, where the order of doing the patch is broken, uh, of sign-off is broken, check patch didn't catch it, none of the checkers caught it, 
but it was caught by the maintainer. Um, there are similar bugs that, for example, Andrew found in my patch, which was a weird one. Uh, so if you look at this device tree patch, for example, uh, the, the tabbing for this is one tab extra. Uh, none of the check patch, uh, you know, the style checkers caught this either. Uh, but it was part of the review that Andrew noticed and uh, reported it back. So, yes, there are static tools, but they are your min baseline. There are much more stringent tools that other people look at, both from human review and from, from tools that we don't know about. Uh, that might appear in the list. So you need to consider both, but at least run the basic checks that are available. Uh, you don't want to be caught with those. Uh, that's really embarrassing. 